All right, so if you're watching this, I'm assuming you've already finished Mutable Board, uh, you've run the unit test, and you're feeling pretty good about it. So this next part, um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what you could do next. So there's two big pieces left. One is the AI, uh, which you will build and hopefully will be able to defeat you, uh, and the other is the game interface. So in principle, you could do either one. Um, the game interface, I think, is a, is a more natural choice, uh, mostly because at this point it's nice to be able to take the mutable board you've already written and get the excitement of seeing like, oh, okay, now I'm going to build an interface. Now, unlike the previous interface uh, that we gave you for DB61B, we're giving you a little bit less stuff. Uh, so I think it seemed to me a little harder uh, to go through and read and understand the skeleton code and write the, the solution. Uh, so maybe a little frustrating, just that usual, okay, what is all this stuff? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, another reason that game interface could be a good place to start is it is a really good way to test the AI after you build it. So the AI, I'm going to say overall, is harder to implement. I mean, the skeleton is easier because we give you less to read. Uh, but overall, I'd say it's probably going to be harder to implement. Um, and in order to actually see that it's working, you're going to, uh, you, could, you could, in theory, write unit tests. Uh, but it'll be a lot easier, I think, uh, to go through and just write game first and then run um, system level tests on your AI using your game implementation. Okay, um, so I'm going to recommend game interface, but up to you. So um, first thing I want to mention before you continue, I really want you to use merge scale. Uh, there were a couple little fixes in the basic game interface, um, and so if anything, you, it's hap if anything weird happens in your code, the first thing we're going to ask you is, go use uh, merge scale and make sure you have the most recent version, uh, and then you know at that point we'll be willing to uh, jump in and see what's up. So merge scale. Uh, okay. So for this potential next step, which I'll call the game interpreter or game.java, um, we are going to build an interface so that a user can actually go through and play the game. So, uh-oh, uh we're not going to be able to get to the instructional servers, though, because they're down. Uh, ooh, ooh, they're that. Okay, it's exciting. Um, so here we are. I want to be able to do things like this. Okay, um, so you're going to write this next, the interface that does all this stuff. All right, the next thing we're going to do is work on our interface for this next project. Um, so much like in our previous DB61B, we're giving you a big skeleton that's going to handle the basics of input, and you're going to fill out some details here and there. Um, now you may wonder, by the way, why is it that we're making you do this fairly unglamorous thing? Uh, well, there was this really neat Quora post that I liked, which was, what are some programs every programmer should make at least once? And uh, I really like this answer. A program which has to interact highly with the user. Users will kill anything you write. Everything. Seriously. So very true. So what we do is give you a picture of what it looks like to build a big, scalable, robust uh, skeleton, let's say, for interaction. And you're filling out some of the details. Uh, and yes, it isn't very exciting and you have to throw all these exceptions. But I think it's a good exercise because there's a bunch of funny little things that as you work with your program, you realize... Uh, you didn't think of while designing the interpreter. Okay, um, so that big skeleton we give you, it's more complicated than what you might have naively done. Uh, and so what that means is that you have to read all this skeleton code and we have all these methods doing all this stuff. Um, and so um, it will seem a little oblique, right? You look at all this code, uh, but I think it's an important skill. Someday, sooner or later, you're gonna be given skeleton code that is big and complicated and you have to jump into it. Um, so it's kind of painful at first, but it's, it's a thing you have to do from time to time. Um, now one little thing, uh, usually you're not going to be given methods that say to do and fix me, uh, but it's better than the alternative where we just wouldn't give you those at all. Um, so basically when it comes to this interface, everything's going to begin with the game.play method. And where you go from there is up to you, though we are going to give you a, a whole ton of, as you can see, many hundreds of lines. Of a, of a starter code. Right? So this is where your code's going to start. And everything from there, uh, if you actually try and run uh, the code, let's see, let's, let's run the original, um, project two. All right, so we run it. Oops. We run it, and instead of doing anything, it just says, welcome to jump 61, compared to what we expect over here. So it's going to be up to you to decide what to do next. Uh, using all these little pieces that we've given you. 
So one way to approach this issue, how do I do things, uh, the way I like to do it is pretend I'm inventing everything from scratch. Like I don't even really have game.java. I mean, I, I have the play method, but I don't have anything else outside of it. So I look here and I say, okay, so based on all this stuff, um, how do I work from here? Uh, and then as soon as I get an idea like, wouldn't it be nice if I could ask the user or to, to print a prompt and ask the user for something? Um, you know, I'll scroll through this thing and I'll see, oh, okay, there's prompt for next, right? And you'll have to do some thinking about what each piece means and it'll, again, as I mentioned, be a little painful. painful. Um, but I would look through and find those, those um, so any place you think, I need something, try and see if we give some piece that will support that, all right? And you may miss some of the little things we, we provide uh, and that's okay. So I would start this whole task by looking at an easy task. Like I want to uh, start by just having it ask me for something and I can say help and I'll get back an answer like this. Um, and I would do it just a little bit at a time, right? So the first thing I do, figure out how do I get a prompt printed out? How do I uh, get help to show up and so forth? Uh, and just slowly add functionality. And in fact, here's a whole list of functionality you're supposed to have. Um, so just add a little bit at a time and, and as you go, you know, you could do some testing right here in what I call an ad hoc manner where you'll, um, oops, that's not even a command. All right, size five. Um, where I can um, test the basic functionality of my program in a window like this. Um, but you also want to use .in file testing as you go. So use a mixture, right? Whenever it feels right, try it out just by typing stuff in. Other times do .in file testing. And don't forget, you wrote all these tests for uh, one of the earlier labs. So was it actually lab nine? Not certain. Well, I'll fix it later if not. Uh, and definitely use the reference solution that we give you as inspiration. Though, reminder, the staff version is not the spec. So if there is a disagreement and we have to decide how to grade something, we'll grade based on the spec. We will not, uh, so you, you should not trust this as the absolute gold standard, but it should be a, an approximately correct solution. Um, and I'd say another thing is, as you're working, for building an interface like this, I think it's pretty much, uh, I'll, I'll say it's okay to leap before you look. That is, don't feel like you have to be 100% confident in your, your ideas before you're willing to run it here, right? So sometimes you'll run something here and get crashes, and that's okay. Because if you're not quite sure how the skeleton code works, right? Because um, there's a lot here, you know, there's 350 lines of skeleton code. Uh, if you're not quite sure how something works, well, make a guess, run it, and see what happens, okay? Um, so I know these are all very vague things. Maybe we'll bring it down to Earth a little bit. Uh, so I believe that most of these pieces of functionality you're supposed to add should be relatively straightforward. Um, you know, there'll be some, some pain here and there, but um, figuring out, for example, how to do size, how to do clear, oops, how to do clear, uh, how to do dump, those should all be relatively straightforward. Um, oh, and actually another thing I should mention is this help file, the staff game, uh, it has commands that are not in the spec. For example, verbose is not in the spec, so you're not required to implement it. I mean, you can if you want, but it's not a thing you have to do. Uh, so be mindful of that. Um, so most of these should be relatively straightforward, but where it's gonna get a little trickier is whenever you need to start uh, actually playing a game. So for example, when I do start, it says, okay, the red player um, is supposed to make some kind of uh, choice. Um, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make blue also manual, and then I'm gonna start. Okay, so I'm gonna say three, five, uh, dump, two, two, dump, and so forth. So being able to handle these commands, these special numerical commands, is gonna be a little different, all right? Um, I'd recommend actually, before you even listen to me explain this, you might actually consider pausing the video or, or putting it on hold and then getting to the point where you can already do help uh, and dump and all those kind of things and then come back then. But your choice. Um, so one important tricky idea is that before a game starts, that is before someone types start, uh, you'll notice that I have a prompt with no particular color, but then after I've typed start, I get prompts with a certain color. So before a game starts, uh, our game class here, it has a bunch of instance variables, one of which is called imp. An imp is a connection to the outside world uh, that allows you to use all your familiar, it's a scanner, and it allows you to use all your familiar scanning uh, scanner methods that you've seen at least uh, in Jump61. So you can say next, 
next int, has next, has next int, and so forth. Uh, and so as long as you are in the basic mode where there's just a little break, uh, the, the basic prompt, we'll keep getting uh, input from the int variable. Now, as soon as someone types start, things change. At this point, uh, the game is going to start calling the make move method of the appropriate player. So in other words, if it's red's turn, then uh, the game class will go look up who the red player is using its player's instance variable. We'll call make move on player. And then uh, the whatever player it is, whether it's an AI or a human, that, that, that object should then make a call to make move uh, in game. So both of these two classes have a make move method. This make move is used by game in order to tell the player to select a move. So the player knows, okay, it's time for me to do something. You know, snooze, snooze, snooze. Ah, oh, okay, my move. Um, and then once I have decided what I want, I call the make move method of game. Uh, so in this case, this make move is, uh, hey player, do something. Uh, this make move is, hey game, do something in reaction to uh, a player's decision. So then, um, what happens if the player is not uh, an AI, but is actually a human? Well, here's where it gets a little confusing, uh, and how the skeleton is set up to do this is that uh, if the player is human, then the input ultimately needs to come from uh, wherever this input is, right? So if it's a human player, it needs to come from input. Uh, and so in that case, um, if player happens to be human, then the whole chain of events is the game calls make move on the human player. The human player then calls get move, which is a special um, method inside of game that gets a board position from the user. The user, oh gosh. Uh, and then uh, once that's done, then uh, the, the player will then call the make move method on whatever it got from the get move method of game. Okay? Um, so I know that's, if you are watching this and have not done any of the game class yet, I am certain that made no sense. Uh, but come back to it later, right? So I think it's one of the, um, probably the trickiest idea about how the input works, um, and uh, that's that. Okay, so one closing thought I wanted to mention uh, is that for this part of the project especially, it is a very good idea to use the debugger. So you may find that you have problems when your program runs, like there's no prompt showing up, or it only takes one command and it never prompts me for anything again. Or I get an infinite number of prompts, right? Uh, I saw all of those when I did my implementation and it is a lot easier to do that kind of debugging if you're willing to use the Eclipse or JGDB or IntelliJ or NetBeans or whatever debugger. Um, it's just, when it comes to this kind of thing, I find the debugger particularly helpful, especially when you have something where you might get caught in infinite loops, right? Um, and I guess uh, if that, Thing we did here didn't quite make sense. Um, if you are writing code that uh, when you when you get to writing the code that deals with the interaction between the game and the player, um, for example, uh, whenever we're doing as a human player, the control gets passed back and forth a couple of times where the game says, "Hey player, make a move." Make move comes back and says, "Hey, I want to get a move." And then once that happens, uh, it goes back to player, and then player then calls make move. Right. So making sure that that handoff of control actually obeys what you expect, it is a lot easier if you're stepping through line by line than it is to have print statements and have to figure out who's what, right? It's just a lot easier if you can see lines of code that are uh, having, having the exact line of code annotated in some way to let you know that this is happening. Okay, so I know that probably all seemed a little vague and was less um, uh, hand-holding, maybe, I don't know, than um, the previous video, but I think in this case, it's a one of the big part of the exercise is really understanding how do I dig through this code and understanding uh, what it does. Okay, so that's that, and then um, soon after this, I'll be putting together an AI video. So good luck with the basic game input uh, or interface, and uh, I will see you for that third video.